We are looking at the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Two weeks ago, we studied the morning lights, what uh, demanded the Reformation from the 1400s, and the morning lights of Waldo, of Wycliffe, and of Hus looked at the kindling of the Reformation last week, and the life and ministry of Martin Luther. Well, there wasn't really a plan to the Reformation. It was simply moved along by the sovereignty of God. It went from Germany now into Switzerland, up north, uh, and began what is called the Radical Reformation. Just stay with me here and I'll show you an aspect of the Reformation. We know about Luther, we know about Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli. A lot of times we're not sure who he was. Martin Luther's break with Rome began the Reformation, but there was much about German Lutheranism that still looked like Catholicism. If you'd come into a German Lutheran church in the 1500s, you would have had to look close because of the, the liturgy, um, the reciting of creeds and the like. It still looked a lot like Catholicism. It had the service, the organization. Um, it had the union of the church with the princes a church state union. The major challenge to the Catholic Church before the Reformation was moral. Everyone wanted them to clean up the nepotism and the simony and the, and the immorality of the church. After Martin Luther, it went deeper. Luther challenged the beliefs of Catholicism, tradition to be placed on the level of Scripture. Uh, sacramental works to add to your merit, to shorten your time in purgatory, that was challenged. Um, the separation of the priesthood, the mass being where Christ died every Sunday in the mystical elevation of the host that changed its substance uh, as opposed to its accidents, the substance changed from the body of Christ and, and the blood of Christ, and you received it, and merit was added to you. And so Luther challenged that and brought it back to the Bible. Well, uh, much of church life remained untouched. Doctrine changed, but how the Christian conducted his life, there was still infant baptism, there was still a, a union of church and state, uh, there had to be a change down deep, and that came in Zurich, Switzerland, by a fellow named Ulrich Zwingli. Well, the Radical Reformation took place in Zurich, and it was independent from Luther, but it was simultaneous with Luther. It was happening at the same time. Within two months of Martin Luther's birth, in 1483, man was born. Uh, that was called God's Mercenary, and his name was Ulrich Zwingli. I believe we have Ulrich right there. He was born in the Alpine village of what is called Wildhaus, or Wild House, Switzerland. How would you like to be born right there? Isn't that nice? It's made out of gingerbread. It really is. <laughs> That's where he was born. And he became a parish priest in uh, Glarus, G-L-A-R-U-S, Switzerland, at the age of 22, he was far more intellectual and well-read than all of his contemporaries. He was a Renaissance scholar. But something in him at Glarus alienated him from the church. It was hard scratching out a living in the Swiss Alps. And so many Swiss felt they could do better by being mercenary soldiers. And they became famous as pikemen. And uh, who's the most famous Swiss archer that shot an arrow, I mean, shot an apple off his son's head? William Tell. He was a Swiss. Pope Julius was called the warrior pope because of his love of military campaigns. And the Swiss were his leading mercenary soldiers. They were his personal bodyguards. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Vatican today, uh, you'll see a Swiss guard. That's a terrifying looking fellow right there, isn't he? But that is a pikeman, all right? And so still today, the Swiss are the bodyguards of the Pope. Well, uh, the town of Glarus was little more than a military encampment 
because of all the mercenaries. And in 1512, or 1515, two years before Luther's 95 Thesis, Pope Julius marched against the king of France, Francis I. And it was right outside Milan, Italy. And Julius's army was slaughtered. How many Swiss lost their lives? 10,000 Swiss lost their lives. And Zwingli, who was a chaplain, his notion of a holy cause by the Holy Father and of Swiss that would follow after him, he lost his confidence in the church. And as a result, he felt that he had misjudged the Pope and warfare, and he wondered where else he had been led astray. And so back home in Glarus, he began doing at almost the same time what Martin Luther was doing in Wittenberg. He began searching and reading his Bible and looking for answers. He realized that he had read much about the Bible, but he had never read the Bible. And when he did, he said he found a new world. He purchased the hottest book of the day, which was a Greek translation of the New Testament by Erasmus, the great Renaissance scholar. And it had Greek sources that predated Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And so he read the Bible in its original text. And, you know, the, the watchword of the, the Reformation was ad fontes, back to the source, back to the fountain. In the Renaissance, you went ad fontes, back to the Greek and the uh, Latin Roman writings. Well, it was the same for the Reformation. People wanted to go back to the Greek and to the Hebrew of the Old Testament to see what God said. And when they compared it to the Latin Vulgate Catholic Bible, they found differences. And people had a problem with that. And so did Ulrich Zwingli. What he did was he led himself to Christ through his Bible study. Uh, and upon his conversion, he began copying Paul's letters, and he began memorizing the New Testament. He also learned Hebrew on his own so he could read the Old Testament. He was made a papal chaplain because Zwingli was a different kind of reformer than Luther. Luther uh, was converted very dramatically and was very bombastic. Ulrich Zwingli was a great scholar. He perhaps was the smartest guy during the Reformation. And so the change came deep and within through this man's uh, studies. He was appointed later as a priest of Einsiedeln in 1516. They elevated him. And, but he wasn't called a priest. Everybody called him the young preacher as his sermons were more than just Catholic 10-minute homilies. Uh, they were more than just reading what the church fathers said about something. His interpretations came from his study in the original Greek and in the Hebrew. And so he became a tourist attraction. No one had ever seen this man in Einseldown, uh, Switzerland, that actually would preach extemporaneously from an open Greek New Testament. No one had ever heard that. And so everybody came to hear the young preacher. And he got so well known that he was elevated again. And he was giving the, given the ultimate plum of church appointment. He was the priest pastor of the leading church of Zurich. It was called the Church of the Great Minster. You see on the left a woodcut of it, and it dominates the city. On the right, it is still there today. The great, the Church of Great Minster, or the Great Church. And on January the 1st, on a Saturday, 1519, on his 35th birthday, Ulrich Zwingli did what no preacher had done for centuries. He stepped to the pulpit and he announced to the church on a Saturday night as they gathered that he would no longer do what had been done. He would not preach prescribed readings and he would not share traditional thoughts from medieval theologians. He was going to teach the book of Matthew, verse by verse, which had not been done for a thousand years. And then he said he would continue through the New Testament. He was going to introduce the people of Zurich 
to the thoughts of God. First hand from the word. Well, God's word went out in a pure, unadulterated form and women and children learned the thoughts of God. And this is what Ulrich Zwingli was about. The Renaissance scholar now became a Bible scholar. There was Luther the reformer, there was Zwingli the expositor, soon to be followed by Calvin the theologian. None of them really aware of what the other was doing at the same time. But God was moving in Germany, in Switzerland, in France simultaneously. Well, one more thing happened in 1519. Zwingli contracted the bubonic plague, the Black Death, and he survived. One author wrote, Zwingli found he could only rely on God's mercy. When he recovered, he was a changed man, a man on a mission to do something bold for God. In other words, he felt God had saved him for a reason, and it was exposing the Word of God to all of Swiss civilization. He was going to lead the people's hearts from idols to the living God, unquote. The Reformation in Zurich was the opposite of Germany. God follows no formulas. Zwingli burned no papal edicts. He wrote no tracts against the Pope. He functioned as the very popular priest in the Catholic hierarchy. He was going to change it from within. The Pope depended upon Swiss mercenaries. So when disturbing reports came from Zurich, the Pope was careful not to offend the Swiss because he needed them militarily. Some of the more radical reformers, however, they wanted to destroy the Catholic Church and they wanted to raise up a new reformed one, much as Luther was doing in Germany. And they felt that Zwingli was too peace-loving. They felt that he restricted the movement of the spirit and they wanted to force the pace. Zwingli believed, he said, that hammers would not affect true change. The true secret of reform was to change the individual hearts by their understanding biblically of the gospel. He wanted to teach about Christ and his redemption, his reconciliation of man, and his propitiation of the wrath of God. He wanted to teach about imputation and the impartation of righteousness to he that believes solely in Christ. Well, instead of campaigning for change, Zwingli taught the gospel. And when changes came to Zurich, they were deep and they lasted. Well, not everyone liked the changes. Genuine Catholics objected to his theology. Monks objected to the changes he brought. So five years after Luther's 95 Thesis, Zwingli wrote 67 oppositions. His main idea was that Christ ruled the church through his word, the Bible, not through the Pope. He felt the Bible, he said, was the master of the house. He also argued that Christ's death was a completed sacrifice. Just once, and you availed yourself of all of its merits simply by faith one time. He did not die every Sunday at the Catholic Mass. That there was no need to change the bread into his body and the wine into his blood and to receive it again. Because once you trusted him, you had received the fullness of God's mercy. And so he was the first one to change communion from something that added to your merit to something that was a spiritual memorial that affected you in your heart as a, as a memorial of what Christ did instead of something added to your ledger. It was no longer a work. It was, an, it was a response of worship of a grateful person. Well, uh, what he did stabbed at the heart of transubstantiation, the Mass. It stabbed at the heart of the need of a priest to elevate the host and the need of a pope to so allow the priest to change the bread and the wine into something that was efficacious for you. All of the dominoes of Catholicism would fall if what Zwingli said was true. So we now had a showdown. 
Martin Luther had the Diet of Worms. Zwingli in Zurich had a public debate. Zwingli defended his views, the Catholic opposition theirs. The city hall at Zurich was packed out. Their religious future was at stake. It was no contest. Zurich, the scholar, was unbeatable. He knew more Catholicism than any Catholic, and he knew more Bible than possibly anybody on earth. And so the city council of Zurich rushed to say that no preaching would be allowed in Zurich except from the Bible. You ever heard of an edict like that? If you were going to be a preacher, you had to preach the Bible. Catholicism had, was now losing not only Germany, but they were losing Switzerland, its neighbor. How could Zwingli get the Bible into everybody? He began a school for preachers. It started with a grammar school for the boys of Zurich. Sorry, ladies, but it was for the boys of Zurich. You'll always find that literacy follows Protestantism. Because Protestantism is based upon the finished work of Christ, that every believer is a priest, and all of them have an individual relationship with God through His Word. If you're going to study the Bible, you've got to be able to read. And so Protestantism will always give rise to literacy. And so he began a grammar school. The next stage was a theological college, and a whole generation of Swiss would be pastors and missionaries who were trained in the knowledge of Scripture. They also came out in 1531 with what was called the Zurich Bible. And so now you had a Bible in German from Luther, and now you had a Bible in Swiss from Zwingli. One historian said, Ulrich Zwingli loaded the bomb bays of the Reformation in Zurich, making the Bible impossible to resist and able to avail yourself of. And he did something else that was revolutionary. He married. He set aside celibacy. He married Anna Reinhardt, but he believed the renouncing of celibacy was a little bit too radical for the time, so he kept his marriage secret for two years so others wouldn't stumble. Once marriage among priests was recognized, Anna came out of the closet. Swiss monasteries began shutting down. Monks and nuns simply were converted and left. Churches removed relics. They removed the images of saints. They removed crucifixes. They removed candles and altars. And they quit preaching in robes and preached in clothes like everybody else. Uh, church organs were removed. Zwingli was a musician, played a number of instruments, but he disapproved of instrumental music in church for fear that its beauty would be such it would lure people to idolize music itself. Isn't that interesting? That's why Kendall left for Disney World. <laughs> and on Easter Sunday, 1525, it happened. The break came. There was no mass, just plain bread rolls on wooden plates on a simple table in the middle of the church with a jug of wine. The spiritual symbol of communion had begun in place of transubstantiation. Easter Sunday, 1525. No Latin was spoken, only the language that the people understood of Swiss. Well, such was the radical Reformation. It reached not just to theological doctrine, but to the lives and the everyday behavior of the people. The break with Rome had now happened in Germany, and it was now happening in Switzerland. Yet, Zurich was part of what was called the Swiss Confederation. Switzerland doesn't just have city, it has cantons. They're like independent entities. Well, the Confederation was part of the Holy Roman Empire, and it saw Zurich's departure the same as uh, Americans would see South Carolina's secession, that it was going to lead everybody away into a break, and they feared that the, uh, the Catholic Church, the Swiss, were going to come and to destroy uh, Switzerland, that the Holy Roman Empire would come with their armies and destroy 
Switzerland, which, if you remember from last week, it happened in Germany with the, the uh, wars of religion. And so what happened was kind of radical. To preempt this, the Swiss Catholics from the other cantons came together and they marched on Zurich, their own city. Uh, they sought to reconvert it to Catholicism to avert what they saw coming from the Pope. They felt that Zwingli and Zurich had to be sacrificed for the greater good. Well, fearing that a Catholic victory would stop the Reformation in Switzerland, Ulrich Zwingli strapped on his armor. He led the men of Zurich in battle, and at the Battle of Capel on October the 11th, this is a woodcut of it, of the two armies coming together. The Swiss army met the Catholics who far outnumbered the Protestants. Zwingli was badly wounded. I believe we have a, a painting of his stabbing. He was stabbed to death. Victorious soldiers found him and they demanded that he pray to the Virgin Mary. He refused, so the captain of Unterwalden stabbed him to death, leaving his men to quarter his body and then to burn it and then to mix the ashes with dung to prevent anyone from ever making his ashes into a relic. Swingley's last words were, you may kill the body, but you cannot kill the soul. His spirit lived on. Heinrich Bullinger took over the leadership of Zurich's Reformation and guided it to maturity over the next 40 years. Five years later after his death, a Frenchman would arrive at a German city called Geneva and bring with him the theological heart of Zwingli. His name was John Calvin. And he would, through the Calvin's Institutes, turn Geneva into the place that would educate the whole of Europe. Well, and there is a picture of Mr. Calvin. He is from Texas Tech, and you see that he says, guns up. Well, one of the problems, and you might say, why is this called the Radical Reformation? Well, one of the problems with any reforming movement is that of excess, when the pendulum goes too far. There was a dark side of the Radical Reformation that most Christians don't know about. Uh, the Catholics said it early on, quote, with no final recognized church authority, like a pope and bishops and priests, when you got every man with a Bible in his hand, no one will be there to check excess, that y'all can have crazies running around because everybody can read the Bible for himself. Or they said, the corrupt that you see in our church is going to be replaced by the bizarre in yours. The fact is, there is no foolproof way to protect the Bible from those who go too far. We don't do stonings in the church. We're not a civil entity. And so if somebody goes too far, at the local level, you can have uh, disciplining and even excommunication. But you can't do it at the church, at the big church level. We have no Protestant pope. And so which would you like? Would you like the freedom to read and coexist with those that err? Or would you like the Inquisition to burn them at the stake? So which would you like? Freedom or the Inquisition? I personally hate being burned at the stake. And so I'll coexist with crazy guys rather than have somebody, because what happens if that top authority gets corrupted? Now we're in trouble. Well, this happened earlier in the Lutheran Reformation. As one of Martin Luther's colleagues, whose name was Andreas Karlstadt, he was a college professor at Wittenberg, a hothead that began to push reform at an uncomfortable rate, and he exhorted mobs to go on shrine-smashing rampages. Any ark that honored Mary or the saints was cast into the flames. Three men came to Wittenberg that were called the Zwickau prophets. They were from Zwickau in Germany. And they said there was no need of a Bible because to them God spoke directly. Hello. They also called for not just conversion, but they wanted to kill any who did not become Protestant. 
It was be Protestant or die. And so Wittenberg was spiraling out of control. Luther came out from Wartburg Castle, came out of hiding, broke his silence to rebuke Karlstadt, rebuke his former students, and to rebuke his followers. He mounted the pulpit at Wittenberg Church, and he echoed Zwingli that the power to change hearts is found only in God's Word and in Christ's ability to change. He said, I will constrain no man by force, for faith must come freely without compulsion. Take myself as an example. I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's Word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with Melanchthon, shouldn't have told you that, the Word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it than I. I did nothing. The Word did all. That was Martin Luther. Well, the radicals felt, uh, Luther felt, had missed the point of the Reformation. That the Reformation was attack against the internal act of adding to the Bible and adding to the work of Christ. The Reformation was not to, to destroy the external manifestations of Catholicism. It's art and it's statues, it's churches. That was not his job. But as Wittenberg was coming under control, elsewhere the radicals broke out again. A fellow named Thomas Munzer, M-U-N-T-Z-E-R. There's Thomas. He saw himself as the new Gideon. He saw himself as the warrior prophet to whom God spoke to personally and said the Bible was the dead outer word. He took the Reformation doctrine of equality into social and political areas. He wanted a revolution against all evil. And at the end of the Holocaust, Christ was going to return and rule. And now the belief in a literal millennium that had not been preached for over a thousand years arose again, that there would be a literal millennium in Christ returning and ruling. That's why one of the problems with premillennialism and the belief in a literal millennium is the guys that oppose it will point to Thomas Munzer and say, you follow the lead of crazy people, and you have to agree with them. Not here, I hope, but you agree with them. And so, the, there was a prediction also in 1524, all the planets would line up in the sign of Pisces, and it would presage evil tensions that were now going to explode. And that seemed to be fulfilled in the Peasants' War of 1524-25. Thomas Munzer led an army of peasants against a town called Frankenhausen, and a rainbow appeared. And he said, that's the sign we're going to win. They were slaughtered. Munzer was caught, caged, tortured, paraded, and then beheaded. That's how you can know you got the wrong sign. Okay. The kingdom did not come. But Luther was now lumped with Munzer. The Reformation, much good would die with Thomas Munzer. And if the Reformation, everybody said, means this, then we want it opposed. That's why Charles read you the text. Because of them, the word of God will be blasphemed. Well, there was more to come. In Harlem of the Netherlands, a baker, his name was John Mathis, there's John. He believed the end of the world had come. He predicted that Munster in northwest Germany would be the new Jerusalem. Somehow when crazy guys think that Christ is going to come back in their day, he's always going to come to where they are. You ever notice that? It's always going to be Tennessee or someplace. Well, all German and European radicals came to Munster like a magnet, like a lightning rod. And by 1524, they voted themselves onto the city council. All city life would now be strictly biblical. Infant baptism was outlawed. Adult baptism was compulsory. You had to get baptized. All property is held in common. They're now communists. And all doors had to be left open day and night. Everybody knew what was going on. Mathis himself rushed out along against a besieging army, convinced of a one-man victory. He was killed. A fellow took his place named James Van Laden, whose claims to leadership is that he ran naked through Harlem, expounding ecstasies, foaming at the mouth. Thank you, Jan Van Laden. 
He was painted right there as what he claimed to be. Uh, he claimed to be the king. He called himself the king, so they painted him as the king. Well, Mr. Van, a besieging army Catholic and Lutheran, entered the city, bringing an end to Jan Van Leyden. He dissolved the city council, and he made himself King David, and he instituted polygamy. And he himself took 16 wives. Let me tell you something about crazy guys. When guys head off, you're always going to find a number of things. He's going to gain power. He's also going to be making money. And there's going to be sex somewhere that's in that. And so that was James Van Leyden. Well, they came, they destroyed the city, they destroyed Leyden. What we have here on the left, there is the beheading of Leyden. And that on the right, you know what that was? Those were cages that were set up at the uh, Catholic Church for Leyden and two of his generals. And they put them in those cages and uh, before and after their death, they let you see them. And they are still there today. It's not real good church decor, but you can still see them today where they were displayed as heretics. Well, you say, man, it couldn't get much worse. Yes, it could. John of Battenberg led the men of Pratzenberg. He thought Van Leyden had not been uh, thorough enough. He killed all who would not join polygamous communism. This is the radical reformation. For the vast majority, the combined scandal of Thomas Munzer, John of Battenberg, Van Leyden, and Munster cast a long shadow of suspicion on the Protestant Reformation. But because of this, many in desire of reform began to turn. Now, this is where it turns. They began to turn to a new, peace-loving, pacifistic Protestantism that was coming out of Zurich. It was one that coined two terms. Pacifism, they would do the opposite of all the other radicals. They would not lift a hand. And the separation of church and state that we're going to separate from everybody. They were called the Anabaptist because they felt that if the Bible didn't teach something, you shouldn't do it. Luther felt if the Bible doesn't teach something, then you're free to do what you would like. They said if the Bible doesn't teach it, you shouldn't do it. We don't see infant baptism, so you shouldn't do it. We don't, don't see Christians... Uh, in the military, therefore, you shouldn't do it. And you shouldn't take oaths, civil oaths, because Jesus said not to. And so, uh, when you said there should be no infant baptism, you should baptize believers later on, that's why they were called Anabaptists, they were baptized again. You put something forth that had not been put forth for a long time, that you would now have children being born that were not baptized as infants, though therefore they were not part of the church. And they would grow up as non-churchmen and as non-Christians, so they said. And you would end up, they would take wives and they would multiply and not baptize their children. And so pretty soon we were going to have, within uh, Switzerland, we were going to have people in the government living in the country that were not ostensibly Christians. Now you say, well, of course, that's the freedom to believe, but that was unheard of. The idea that you could be in a country under the law of the state and not be under the absolute law of God, that was unheard of. And so the Anabaptists were seen not merely as errant, they were seen as anarchist, and society would lose its structure. Well. The season of Lent, 1522, a group of Zwingli's followers, 12 of them, gathered for a Lenten meal, but they did not forbid meat because the Bible didn't forbid meat. It didn't even mention Lent. They ate sausages. Zwingli didn't join them because he said, that's going a little bit too far on what you want to do. But he supported his friends because he said Lent is a human idea. Historians now, church historians call this Sausage gate. That's a fact. Because we changed. 
If it's not in the Bible, you can do what you will. If it's not in the Bible, you can't do it. Well, the Reformation was now moving from church doctrine and theology to behavior. And so it's called, my daddy would say he's going to get you by the short hairs. Did y'all ever have a daddy say that to you? Well, the Reformation have got you by the short hairs. It's up where you lived. Well, to have new first century congregations of true believers. And if the Swiss church would not allow it, then these people would split. And the Catholics said, aha, I told you this would happen. First, you got Zwinglians that separate from the Catholics. And now you got a group within Zwingli and Zurich that are going to separate from the split. You got a split within the split. You are now fraying. You've got Lutherans. You got Zwinglians. Now we got Anabaptists. Here in a little bit, we got Calvinists. They said, I told you this was going to happen. You are now doing what's right in his own eyes. We're losing the central voice of the church. Well, they refused infant baptism. They embraced only believer's baptism. And a public disputation was held in Zurich. The idea that people could be citizens and not baptized or non-Christians, that was unheard of. And so they had a public disputation. Zwingli won the debate as he equated infant baptism with Old Testament people that were circumcised at birth, holding the community together. Everybody went with Zwingli because they could not live with the notion of theological religious freedom, of having non-Christians in your country. They couldn't live with it. And so they said, we go with, Zurich, with Zwingli. And what happened? All children were ordered to be baptized. And if not, these 12 people that had begun the break, then they would be banished from Zurich. The next day, what do you think happened? A small group met at the house of one of the new Anna Baptist. His name was Felix Maintz. Among them were Conrad Grable and George Blue Rock. Grable baptized Blue Rock, who baptized the rest. So we officially now had a split within the split, a distinct movement. It was called the Swiss Brethren. The city council of Zurich ruled that these schismatics were going to corrupt the whole city, and so they were drowned. And that is a watercolor of the day, was they marched them out and they put them in the river, they tied them up and they drowned them. They said, you like water? We'll give you water. Unlike the German radicals, they would not fight back because they were pacifist. Most of all, they were separatist. They separated from Catholicism, Lutheranism, the government, the world. Communal living began common as is seen today in their descendants. Who do you think the descendants are of the Anabaptists? You say Baptists? Wrong. They came from English separatists. These guys, who is it that you think of today that lives communally, that separates from everybody, that will shun you if you part from their ways, uh, and they grow their beards? The Amish. The Amish became the descendants of the Anabaptists. And if you were an Amish that liked electricity, you became a Mennonite. Okay. <laughs> and so the Anabaptists now became, you had Lutheranism, you had Zwinglianism, and now you had Anabaptists. They drew up their own confession. It was called the Schleitheim Confession. It held to believers' baptism only, the shunning of sinful Christians, the Lord's Supper only for believers. See, they didn't have a visible church and within it the true believers. They felt that the visible church was to be the invisible church. And if you didn't keep the rules, they did what was called shunning. And they set you apart. Uh, you had separation from non-Christians. You had the importance of shepherds at the local church level only. And the shepherds were voted on by the local Christians because they saw that as the Bible. It's funny, when you look at Anabaptists, you'll see certain things you're not on. Believer's baptism, yes. Um, communion for true Christians, yes. Local church authority, yes. But they also believed in pacifism, that you couldn't join the military, and uh, that you could not take an oath in court, because Jesus said you couldn't. 
Luther called them the new monks because holiness was more important than theology. Their leader became a priest named Minnow Simons. I believe we have Minnow here. And uh, they were led in becoming the Mennonites. So now you had Mennonites, Anabaptists. Their problem was the elevation of life over theology. If a point of biblical theology appeared to disagree with practical living, then that point was explained away. Thus, they got weak on theology and high on practical living. I talked once to an Amish girl that had come out from them. And I said, Is, how serious are you guys, Amish? She said, oh, don't kid yourself. We're as carnal as anybody else. She said, well, you think you're, we're holy because we ride them buggies, don't you? I said, yeah, I'm pretty holy to me. She said, we compete as to who's got the best buggy. You want the best buggy and you'll go down to a, a junkyard and you'll start, the men will take seats and upholstery out of the cars and put them in their buggies. And then if you got the top buggy and another guy's got a top buggy, you got to beat him on his horse. He may have a horse, but you've got to get a Morgan horse. So you got to get a Tennessee, Tennessee Walker. Then you got to get a thoroughbred. And so she said, we don't have Mercedes and, and Lexus, but we got buggies. And so I said, are people Christians within that? She said, no, no. Practicality is so exalted that theology is overlooked. And so we have lots of people thinking that they're going to heaven because they're born into a family with beards and little black hats. Interesting. Well, the Anabaptist in time, the idea of man being dead to God through Adam's sin, no works required for salvation, divine election, even the full humanity of Christ. They felt that Christ couldn't have had true flesh and been a true man, that he had heavenly flesh. And they began to make doctrinal errors in things that were not practical and radical down where you lived. They explained them away as being nuances. Now, Baptist came from England. English Puritans that lived under Queen Elizabeth. And Elizabeth had what was called the Middle Way. It was a little bit Protestant, a little bit Catholic, a little bit Anglican, it was to satisfy everybody. And certain Puritans couldn't stomach that compromise. And they were called separatists. And they started their own congregations, biblically run, that had uh, no bishops above them, and they practiced adult baptism. And they became what were called particular Baptists because they believed Christ only died for the elect. Later they had general baptism, or Baptists where Christ died for all. And so the Baptists came really out of separatistic Puritans out of England. Anabaptist gave us uh, Amish Mennonites and their cousins were the Quakers where you would hear directly from God and shake. Okay. And so you fall into three categories. The Anabaptist saw the Bible as supreme in all things and separated from everybody. Spiritualists like the men of Munster that felt they could hear God speak to them personally, and the Bible was simply a lesser means. And then thirdly, were rationalists who felt traditional Reformation guys had not gone far enough that any church belief that contradicted practicality or sound reason should be set aside, including the Trinity, the virgin birth, as well as indulgences and the Mass that true faith had to be practical. As a matter of fact, one of the early guys that broke was called Faustus Socinius. And Socinianism denied the Trinity, thought Christ was just a man. And in so doing, out of the Anabaptist practicality and aversion to theology, there was sowed the seed, one fellow said, of rational, moral, modern liberalism that come the enlightenment period would explode into an entire culture. And so what is the lesson of the radical reformation? Well, 
It introduced to us a problem that we're still struggling with today. Should we have the removal of religious freedom to secure unity and put all authority in one guy, a pope, and his bishops? Now, if you have a pope and bishops and priests and common men, you now have a sense of unity and you don't have schisms. But what happens if that one guy gets corrupted? Now you have the inquisition if you disagree with him. Anybody want that? Well, or should we have the freedom of the believer to believe like he wants from the Bible, restrained only by the local church? And should we have the freedom of any and all to reject the Bible and still live within that culture, knowing that we can become bizarre and we can become crazy and you can have cults. So which would you like? Would you like a pope that can burn you or would you like to coexist with cults? And everybody have the right to reject the Bible, reject Christ, or to invent their own Christianity and to be disciplined only at the local church level. You can't have both. Which will you take? Freedom? Or should we let the church step into the place of government and let them make government the church? Great. Which church? Me, obviously. No, which church? Would you have the Episcopal? Would you have the Anglicans rule as in England? Would you have the Lutherans rule as in the electorates of Germany? Which would you have? That's why America was called the Grand Experiment. All right, to have the church not issuing state decrees, to have the state that would stay out of church business, and that the state would be affected by the effect of the church, not through decrees, but through the church being the best guys of the country, the people of light and salt that would put men in position to influence government, hold back the natural decay of history and produce a society where men could live and thrive in peace. That was the idea. And that's why you can come tonight and look at these men talk about Christian rulers in our country about religious liberty, the radical reformation. We need a hymn. A real good hymn about burning and uh, <laughs> cages on a church. How many of you have ever heard, my hope is in the Lord who gave his life for me? Let's stand and we'll sing this together. All right. Great hymn, great reformation ideas. Watch the words. Hmm. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives no merit of my own his anger to suppress my only hope is found in jesus righteousness for me he died for me he lives and everlasting life and light he freely gives. His grace has planned it all, tis mine but to believe and recognize his work of love and Christ 
receive for me he died for me he lives and everlasting life and light he freely gives you know we didn't plan to have christian politicians in our midst tonight at just the time we talked about the issue of the radical revolution but we did and they asked me if i could share for about 10 minutes a little homily on a christian's place in prayer and in government where you have non-christians involved and so it just so happened that these things came right together but at six tonight we'll gather with some uh, very prominent men to talk about where we are in the issue of Christian liberties. Father in heaven, thank you for what we sang about. For me, he died. For me, he lives. And everlasting life and light he freely gives. Thank you. No merit of my own. His wrath now to suppress but only Christ and his righteousness. How wonderful an idea. To be reborn and to pick up my, babe, my Bible and to be able to read it and to know for myself the works of God. To, to live within a community enlightened that can impact and affect this world, that can slow down the curse in this world. We thank you. And we pray, God, for the... Uh, last few weeks as we study next week the coming of the great theologian of John Calvin in Geneva of the Reformation in England and the arisal of the Puritans that would come across the pond to Massachusetts and open the door for 20 plus thousand other Puritans to come to this country we pray God that you might make us wise unto the cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. And if there is any one man or woman here this morning that is trusting in their good works to earn before God the pronouncement of not guilty, that you could show them that their sin is immedicable, it is a stain, it is irredeemable. There is nothing they can do to remove their, their spot they can only wash their robes in the blood of Christ. This morning, would you have them as Zwingli, as Luther, as Melanchthon from the preaching of the word to flee unto Christ. And this we ask in his name and for his sake, our sole mediator before the Father. Amen.